Good morning and welcome. Welcome everyone. Welcome to today's SC Launch and Learn with Tyler Tatum of Three Phase SC. Today we are discussing SBIR and STTR grants and how Three Phase can help get you there to the end. Before we begin, I'd like to go over two housekeeping items. First of all, if you can hear me, please raise your hand in the webinar controls. Jonathan, Natalie, George, thank you. Carmen, thank you all very much. You can go ahead and lower your hands. That's an important, <laughs> important first step that we can all hear me, so thank you. Um, secondly, on the format of today's webinar, we will keep all of the audience audio muted. So if you have any questions, please type them in to the webinar controls at any time. We're gonna pause about halfway through um, to open up the line for questions. So I will be reading the questions out loud and Tyler will be answering them. We'll have another Q&A session at the end. Uh, my name is Julia Linton. I wanna welcome you all here. I serve as the operations manager for the SC Launch program. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Tyler, to the table as he dives into SBIR and STTR grants. Tyler, I'd like to welcome you here, and the mic is now yours. All right, thank you. Thank you for the intro and uh, excited to uh, get started here. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, it's good to partner up with SGRA and get this content out there. Um, my main goal for this presentation is to give you an overview of of three phase as well as um, SBR, STTR, and ideally by the end of this you understand better whether your company or people you know who have a company might be a good candidate and we could have a further conversation. Um, so. Um, I'll jump right in. I have some slides on three phase and how to engage us and things along those lines in the presentation. Um, so what is SBIR or STTR funding? Um, so for those of you who might not know, I'll go a little bit of, into a little bit of detail, but it's a, it's a large pot of money that's set aside from the regular research and development budget of the government, um, $2.5 billion. Um, and it, that, that equates to about three and a half percent of the overall uh, federal research and development budget. Um, it's available for small businesses only, um, small businesses under 500 employees. So sometimes, uh, for especially for a lot of us entrepreneurs, you know, there are larger companies applying for this, but overall it's targeted at small business. And there's 11 agencies that offer this. Um, I have details on that a little bit later. Um, it's equity-free funding. So that uh, that basically means that the government is not looking to get equity or ownership in your company in exchange for this money. Um, what they get in return for their investment is they are hoping to create the next Google, Qualcomm, that eventually is paying taxes back into the government. So that's their return on investment. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people ask, like, you know, how do they get paid back? Well, that's how they get paid back. Um, there, there are strings attached. We'll get into that. But, but overall, you do not have to give up equity for this money. So that can be very attractive. Um, and ideally, you can use this money to go after outside either investors, customers, partners, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the goal uh, or, or the goal I like to present to companies is using this SBR funding in order to prove out the things you need to prove out in order to get outside investors, customers, partners to uh, basically give you money. So. Um, that's the basic idea. Uh, there's two versions of the program. There's what's called SBIRs, Small Business Innovative Research Grants. Uh, that is a larger pot of money. It's, it's just over 3% of the overall federal research and development budget. Um, STTRs are a partnership between a research institution and the small business. 
the small business still is the lead prime and applies, um, but the the partnership with the unit, the research institution is required. Um, and there's a, a portion of the money that has to go to the research institution. I have a slide on that later where I'll get into more details. It is a smaller pot of money. It's about a half a percent of the overall federal budget or federal research and development budget, but it can be very valuable as a tool for certain entities. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, when you're going after SBR or SDTR money, you have to realize that you are dealing with the government and you're dealing with government objectives. Um, sometimes that can be frustrating for us entrepreneurs. Um, and, you know, I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years and uh, through various startups. And and the, uh, the thing I like to say about SBRs, STTRs is, you know, when you're dealing with the government, don't try to argue with them in terms of, you know, the color or the size or the shape of the box they're asking you to check. Just give them the info they need to check the box and move on. Um, if you fight with them on it, it's just going to be painful on both sides. Um, so, but a lot of times they just need just enough information so they can go on to the next step. Um, and if you kind of treat the government that way, you can get through it more effectively but there is a lot of annoying things that you have to deal with there. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to get into, uh, does my company qualify? Um, and so I'm going to look at this from a few different angles, both the eligibility criteria as well as, you know, just our lessons learned about who, you know, is potentially fundable and who's not. Um, Eligibility. So you have to be less than 500 employees, like I mentioned before. It has to be a for-profit small business. Um, we've run into, uh, you know, different groups who were either nonprofit or kind of like a hybrid, and that gets a little bit tricky. Um, so you need to, you know, consider that issue and make sure you're a for-profit small business. Um, independently owned and operated primarily in the U.S., that's important. Uh, so 51% ownership in the U.S. We've run into issues with companies that were foreign owned and aren't a good candidate. Uh, the PI for an SBIR has to be 51% employed by the small business. That does not mean that the grant has to fund them 51%. It just means they can't be getting a salary outside of the company that's basically bigger than the salary they're getting through uh, the, the company. Uh, that can, um, with STTRs, with all but the National Science Foundation, you can actually have the PI be part of the small business or the research institution. And that can be uh, valuable, especially depending on the resume credentials and and whatnot of the uh, of the PI. So we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so the other key point is research must be performed in the U.S. They want you to spend the money in the U.S. and sometimes that can be an issue. I was on the phone with a company just yesterday that I'm working with and. They're using software that's overseas, and they were going to give part of the sub award to that overseas company, and that's that's a no-no. That can be very problematic. So, um, what if I'm investor-owned? So, there's a lot of that could be. There's a lot of of um, confusion here, so I'm not going to be able to explain the entire scenario there, but the basic idea is if you are over 50% owned by investors or venture capital firm, then let's talk, um, especially if you're VC owned. That gets a little bit complicated. There are some exceptions to the rule in terms of whether you're eligible for SBRs or STTRs. Uh, some agencies let VC companies uh, still apply and get funded. Some do not. 
uh, we just need to work through some of those complications. The main issue is when you consider the venture capital firm and all of their affiliates and partners, et cetera, et cetera, does that total number of employees across you, the VC, and all their affi affiliates equal 500 employees or less? That's part of the question that they have to answer. Um, but any, anyway, if, that, if you're in that category, let's talk. Um, what companies are fundable? So what we see is that most of the agencies want to fund innovative technology. And so it's important to think about, uh, and, and each agency is slightly different in terms of how, the, how they define what's innovative and what's not. For example, National Science Foundation says it's got to be game-changing next generation technology. So they don't want to fund a simple iteration. Um, NIH, on the other hand, National Institute of Health, they're more likely to fund something that's iterative. If you're taking, say, for example, an existing drug and tweaking it to go after a different condition. So uh, in general, though, if you're just innovating a business concept and there's not really any technology backing your idea, then you're probably not eligible for SBR, STPR. Uh, you also want to have a defendable technology. So that means that you need something that's protectable, not always patented or patentable. Uh, a lot of times it does relate to technology that can be patented. However, you really need to have something that's defendable where they can't look at it and go, well, anyone could do this. So that's an important one, especially when you get into like apps and like basic app ideas that are uh, they're quote unquote technology, but there's not research backing them, which goes into the, the next point. You know, the ideas need to be research backed. Uh, so there are apps that get funded, but they're usually backed by science, especially in the health arena. So that's something to uh, that's important to consider. Um, product market fit, fit can be important. There are some agencies where the commercial markets don't matter so much, like Department of Defense and NASA. However, when that's the case, really your product market fit is how you fit into their needs. Uh, but either way, you need to consider product market fit is important. Um, te technology actually fits topic. So this can be uh, very critical with some of the agencies that are picky, like Department of Defense, uh, DHS, Department of Education, if you're outside of what they say they want to fund, then you're you're going to have a hard time getting money out of them. Uh, incredible team. So the team can be very important, both on the business side and the technology side. What's not fundable? Or what, what do we see that has a lot of trouble getting through the agencies? Uh, if you're putting existing technology together just to build a novel app concept, for example, or a web-based platform, but there's not necessarily <clears throat> innovation behind your idea, then that can be more problematic in terms of getting funding. If you're focused on an innovative business idea and there's not new or novel technology backing it, that's also one that doesn't quite fit with the agencies. Again, they want to fund innovative technology. Uh, if your team doesn't have any technical experience and you just have a business team that's, that's got a technology idea, that can be problematic. That, however, can be fixed by teaming up with the right either academic or other partner to pull in people to your team. So we can actually talk through that one and maybe fix that problem. But we do see that if that is not fixed or the team is not added to, that those teams don't tend to get funded. Uh, does it fit with the agency topic or doesn't fit? That's a problem. No preliminary data. So if it's just an idea and there's nothing backing it uh, yet, so 
you either don't have any basis in the literature, you can't cite any articles basing your your concept, things along those lines. If it's just like, hey, I have a great idea, those don't tend to get funded. Uh, there really needs to be some science or data backing your concept. Uh, and then the final thing is if, if you're basically either out into the marketplace already or there's really not a quote unquote, like a research element to what you need funded, those things don't tend to get funded either. If you just need to like build it and deliver it and you, you've got all the validation and, and everything figured out, then you might not be a good fit. What can I use the money for? Um, and at a high level, I want to start there. You need to think about the fact that this money can help line up your ability to get either angel funding, VC funding, partner funding, um, or customer sales. So with all of those groups I just mentioned, part of your homework and what you really need to help figure out is what do those customers, partners, VCs need me to, to show them in order for them to be interested in handing money over to me? So there's usually some critical question. On the customer side, it's usually value proposition driven. So it's usually uh, say you're building a, a new material like a carbon fiber type material and you're going after um, uh, one of the markets out there and the customers you're talking to say, well, gee, if this was the same price point as my current solution or close to it and was 50% stronger, then I'm interested. If it's 10% stronger, I don't care. Well, now you have metrics that you can go and prove out with your phase one, phase two funding or your SBR funding. Um, and when I say SBR, SBR, STTR, I use interchangeably. So don't, uh, don't think I'm not talking about STTR. Um, so with investors, they may say, well, you have to go out and find your first customer and validate that they're interested. Well, then you got to go to the customer and, or potential customer and understand what they need to see so that they're excited about your technology or innovation. But at a high level, you want to use the money so that you can bridge to these other pots of money, be it customers and angel investors, et cetera. Um, and in that concept, you're, you're reducing your risk and increasing your value uh, as you do that. So the program gives you uh, an opportunity to go after phase one and phase two. Phase one is all about feasibility. So it's answering the critical questions, commercial-based questions, where uh, you essentially can make a go, no-go decision as to whether you should move forward. So the way I like to say that sometimes is if there are questions out there where if the answer is no, you can pack up and go home, then those are potentially good questions or research to do in a phase one. Of course, that's not the answer you want. You want the opposite answer, but it's good to think about that in terms of feasibility. So sometimes that can be, can I make it small enough? You know, can I make it large enough? Can I scale it? Can I produce 100,000 of these? Uh, can I, you know, and, and um, are there certain strength metrics or other metrics that, like we talked about before that I have to hit to make sure that, you know, my customer is interested? All those are good feasibility studies in phase one. And in phase one, you're not going to build necessarily a full minimum viable product. Uh, you might build just enough of a prototype to answer those questions. It might be large, clunky um, and in phase two, you can shrink it down and, and productize it. Um, so phase one tends to be about 150K. It's six to 12 months. Again, it's about feasibility. Uh, one other quick point, in an SBIR, you can only subaward out a third of the grant in phase one. In phase two, you can subaward out 50% and 
and in phase two you're dealing with a million dollars plus or minus so and you have two years to get the work done uh, so it's it's a much bigger pot of money your goal should be get through phase one show feasibility get the best results you can so you can get phase two and do some real work um, phase three is basically the government counting the fact that you've gotten someone else's money there is no phase three SBR or STTR money. Um, and I'm moving through quickly just because, you know, I want to make sure we have enough time to talk to your questions and whatnot. Uh, so more specifically, when you develop your budget, there's three categories of, of or pots of money in a, in a budget. The first is direct cost. <clears throat> and the main thing there is your salaries and wages, Materials and supplies is, you know, another main one. If the grant allows it, travel. A lot of times you may subaward some of the research and development out to university or another partner. And then there's other direct costs. Uh, you may need to rent specific facilities. Um, you may need to uh, buy equipment. Equipment is a tricky one. They really don't want you to spend over five grand on equipment unless it's absolutely necessary, or you're going to basically make it non-usable, you know, like you couldn't turn around and sell it at the end of the grant. They don't want people using the money to basically pad their labs. So they're kind of picky about spending the money on equipment. But so there's several things that are directly related to the grant. There's also a pot of money called indirect. And indirect is basically expenses that if you had multiple grants or, or contracts going on at the same time, these expenses would cross multiple grants. So that can be rent, you know, for your facilities. It can be accounting cost. It can be, um, you know, some general business expenses like legal. Uh, but basically, there's a list of things that are unallowable. And those things that are unallowable are what you have to spend the third category on, which is your profit or fee. So the SBR program allows you to ask for up to 7% profit or fee. And that is your pot of money to use on whatever you want. Um, so the way I like to say it is you have direct cost. You have these things that are not allowed by the government to that, you know, that you're not allowed to spend government money on those can be interest on loans patent cost um alcohol of all things so there's a whole list of, or there's a list of marketing and sales cost so there's unallowable cost there's direct cost anything in between you know whatever you can squeeze out in terms of indirect cost for your grant you can spend indirect cost on so um which agency uh, I'm going to roll through this kind of quick, but there's 11 different agencies. Um, depending on your technology and where you fit, you want to start by kind of targeting some of these groups. Uh, Department of Defense is very broad. They have a lot of very specific topics, but they have like hundreds of them. So you might be a good fit there, but DOD is worried about their problems. So you got to consider that aspect. If you're health related, you can probably fit with the Department of Health and Human Services or NIH, National Institute of Health. It's all the same thing. Um, NASA, NASA is worried about getting to Mars by 2030. So if you, you can look at all their topics, but most of them are related to that problem. Uh, Department of Energy deals with energy related technologies. Uh, they have very specific topics. Um, National Science Foundation, they're all about next generation technology and that can be medical it can be you know they're 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 very broad in terms of what they fund but they do have that mandated mission of we are funding you know the leap from for example uh dvds to streaming video that's the type of leap they're looking for <clears throat> uh, department of homeland security they're concerned about you know chemical biological detection attacks um, you know, people sneaking nukes into the country, things like that. 
uh, Department of Agriculture or USDA, they're going to be concerned about ag related issues. Um, and then there's some of the smaller agencies, but, and we're happy to talk you through which one fits. But here's some basic, we've talked through a lot of this, but at, at a very high level, you know, again, National Science Foundation, they're worried about that, that, you know, general relational leap in technology. DOD, they care about their own problems and the decisions are very program manager driven. Uh, NIH, on the other hand, is, is all health related, but they're very scientifically driven. So you have to be able to pass a very picky review panel um, in order to go after that funding. Um, so, and this just outlines basically the timing. Uh, Department of Defense has three solicitations a year. So does National Institute of Health. There's also other special solicitations as well as a contract solicitation for NIH. Um, National Science Foundation, this is actually wrong. They just switched a few months back. They actually have four openings per year. Um, and they also request a pitch project be submitted before you submit a full proposal, um, which we can help with both as three phase. Um, so Nat and some of the other agencies just have one a year. So you have to be aware of which group you want to go after in their solicitations. Um, so I'm going to go through this real quick and then we'll take a pause for questions. And then I'd like to finish up with, um, actually we can pause now before I jump into the next section. Um, Julia, do you, do you want to pause and see if anyone has yeah. questions? Great, thank you, Tyler. Um, if you all have questions, go ahead and type them in now to the webinar controls. I will ask the questions and then Tyler will answer them. Great, Jonathan, okay. It looks like we've got our first question that just came in. The question is, do you have to have profit or be profitable to be eligible for a phase one? Tyler? Uh, yeah, absolutely not. Um, Actually, it's it's very rare that a company is profitable before applying. Uh, usually, your goal is to use the money to get to a more profitable place. So, um, most of the companies we deal with, you know, I'd say probably most have zero revenue before you know before they apply. Great, thank you. Looks like another question is being typed as I'm speaking, so I'll wait just a second to see if that question comes in in time. There we go. All right, another question has come in. Are, publication, are publications covered under direct costs? Tyler? Yeah, so this depends on the agency a little bit. Some agencies are more picky about that, but they're not gonna allow you to ask for a lot of money for that. So sometimes you can, for example, with like National Institute of Health, you can slip in like, uh, you know, $1,500 for publication fees and, and they won't ask many questions. Uh, groups like the National Science Foundation and some of the other ones are more picky on those sort of budget items. Uh, but in general, you know, it's not, a lot of companies don't ask for money for publication costs. Great, thank you. Those are all of the questions that have come in for right now. So I'll let you go ahead and get back to your presentation. But for everybody on the line, go ahead and keep typing those questions in as they come up. And then Tyler can um, wrap up his presentation at the end with another set of Q&A. So, well, one, of yeah. course, has just come in right now. So, Tyler, would you like to take okay. this question before you get started again, or do you want to keep going? Yeah, let's going? do it. Let's All do right, one more. that's good. Okay, are there any agencies other than the DOE that have grants for renewable energy? Yes. So, I would argue that most of the agencies, in some shape, form, or fashion, deal with renewable energy. Actually, for example, USDA, uh, Department of Agriculture, 
has a part of their proposal is whether your technology relates to renewable type um, solutions. So it may be ag related and it may help with energy conservation, et cetera, et cetera. And that can be a bonus for your USDA proposal. A National Science Foundation funds plenty of things that are renewable related. Uh, Department of Defense, again, their topics are very specific, but if there is a topic out there, I have seen a lot of topics out there that are targeted at that, so that can be a, the case. It's, it just depends on exactly what your technology is, and we could talk through that, but there are a lot of groups that fund renewable energy related solutions outside of Department of Energy. Great. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and keep running down the questions um, okay. that have come. If that's okay with you, we'll just knock some of yeah, these that's out. Yeah, great. Okay, great. So this is a follow-up from the previous question. Um, same person saying, I'm thinking of wind generators for high-rise buildings. What are your thoughts on that, Tyler? I think that that could be, for example, a good target for um, uh, like National Science Foundation might be interested. We'd have to talk through some of the details of the technology and and where it stands um, because again they're kind of picky about that next generation leap. But they, you know, that could be a good target for them. Um, depending on how you kind of fit it into the whole agriculture picture, it might fit because it, you know. There are, some, I could think about like buildings within agriculture, like silos or things like that, where you could use wind energy. Um, it's not a high rise per se, but it's it's related. Um, there's, uh, trying to think of other groups like, you know, the um, DOD may or may not, like again, there's, you might actually with Department of Defense, you might have to either search past topics to see if anyone out there has put something like that out there or build a relationship with a program manager that's in that that would be interested in that and actually with department of defense if you have a topic that's interesting to a program manager you can actually write the topic for them and they can you know tweak it as they see fit and take that to their chain of command and get it put out there as an official topic on the solicitation so you could actually precede your own topic with DOD if you have the right relationship there or Department of Defense. Um, but those are just off the top of my head thoughts. But I'd be happy to talk through that more offline. Great, thank you. Um, we have one final question that's come in. I'm just, just gonna throw it your way before you get started. The question is what accounting packages and or regulations in parenthetical, it says FAR are required. Yeah, FAR. Um, so basically, uh, this gets a, uh, I mean, there's there's exceptions here, but, but a lot of the groups that I've worked with basically use QuickBooks, but there is a specific way that you have to manage your QuickBooks in order to be compliant with government, uh, you know, accounting regulations. So there's a couple main things there. One is that you need to uh, have some sort of timekeeping like package so that you're tracking the people who are direct on the grant are properly tracking their time. Um, and the other thing there is that you need to have a good separation of when I talked about those direct costs versus the indirect costs versus what I call unallowables, which we, you would pay for out of profit or other money that you get, you need to be able to separate the, out those three buckets of cost. Um, I, I'm happy to share with anyone, I have a chart of accounts that I've used for companies I've run in the past uh, that you know works for government accounting. Uh, but if you load that chart of accounts and you follow those entries in terms of your direct, your indirect, and your, your unallowables, then you should be fine there. But in terms of actual package, as long as you can load up your own chart of accounts, any of the software packages should work. It's just making sure you allocate the cost to the right 
uh, accounts based on that direct and indirect cost. Great, thank you. I'll let you go ahead and get started back on your um, your presentation here. So I will go ahead and mute myself. And again, to okay. everybody, keep the questions coming and we'll pick back up with the Q&A at the end. Thank you. Sounds great. So I'm gonna talk about a few of the um, the programs outside or opportunities outside of your standard phase one SBIR. The first one here is STTR. I talked about this a little bit, but the details are that you basically are partnering with a research institution and or a federally funded research and development center. So like Oak Ridge National Labs can actually be a partner, a research partner for an STTR. Uh, the USDA labs can be your STTR partner. So there are people, you know, and, and then of course all the universities and or nonprofit research institutions out there are good research partners. Um, so this, this vehicle allows you to do two things that can be important in going after SBR, STTR. One is that instead of only being able to subaward a third of the grant in phase one, you can actually, you're required to subaward 30% to your, uh, your research partner, uh, but you can, you can actually go up to 60% in terms of the amount of money you can allocate to them. Uh, the best way to think of that is that the company has to do 40%, the research partner has to do 30%, and then there's 30% that's up for grabs to either of those parties or another party. So I have had situations where there's, you know, at least three parties involved. There's the small business, there's the research institution that's basically the partner, and then there may be another university or small business or, or even large business involved that you want to subaward, say, like 29% to. So it gives you flexibility in splitting up the money, especially if you have to give more money than that 33% away to get the work done. Um, <clears throat> you still need to look like a business, and the small business still needs to do 40%, but it gives you flexibility there. With all agencies but National Science Foundation, the PI, like I said before, can be 51% employed by the research institution or the small business. This can be more important with someone like National Institute of Health, where they're very concerned about resumes and you know publications in the technology area that you're proposing. So for example, if, if the professor has invented the technology but they intend to keep their professor job forever and ever, they can actually be the PI in a phase one and or the phase two and have that resume and credentials, you know, uh, that'll help you get through the review panel, but they can stay on the research institution side. So um, one thing to note is that, you know, in a National Institute of Health and even Department of Defense, like in these sort of situations, they're more concerned, NIH is very concerned about the credentials of the team and the ability to get the work done. Department of Defense is very concerned about, can you solve my problem? So um, even NASA is more flexible on the, you know, um, or, or they're not as concerned. They want you to look like a real company, but they're not gonna hammer you quite as much there. Um, National Science Foundation, however, is very much about we want to push companies out. So that's why they have, they don't allow the exception on the PI requirements and they really want to see business or it can, it can be, for example, a PhD or postdoc who's nurtured the idea, but they want to see someone as the entrepreneurial lead in the company who can take, who can move the company forward. So. But again, SDTR, so you should ask, a lot of people ask, well, the pot of money's smaller, so should I do an STTR? And my response is, let's look at how you're structured, what you have to do, and what fits best, especially in a phase one. And if an STTR fits better, 
then your chances are going to be higher even though the, the pot of money is smaller. So you just want to make sure you match up your situation to the, the best grant vehicle, not necessarily worry about the pot of money. Because one fact is that there, there are less STTR proposals than there are SBIR proposals. So the funding rates are probably, or I think they tend to be about the same with either vehicle. Um, so next up. Okay, there we go. Um, fast track. So the only agency that really does fast track is National Institute of Health, but they allow you to apply for a phase one and a phase two at the same time. Uh, some really critical things to think about, though, is that uh, if you're going to go this route, uh, your phase one needs to be like a no questions asked type research effort. So there needs to be very little risk in the fact of whether you'll be successful in phase one. So it doesn't mean that you've done the work, but when the reviewers look through it, they need to go, yeah, this is pretty much, they just need to do the work and it'll come out okay. Uh, the other thing is that you need to have commercial partners and or a good commercialization story as to how you're going to get funding at the end of phase two, whether that's investors or um, you know, in health related applications, like do you have you talked to Blue Cross Blue Shield or someone like that that says, gee, this is great, I would really like to have it? Um, that can be really important in terms of a successful fast track. Um, but again, you know, they're they're more picky about these and it's a much more extensive application. Direct to phase two. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you really need to have a history um, of a business and also, especially with uh, National Institute of Health, again, is one that does direct to phase two, Department of Defense does too. Um, in this situation, you're basically competing with people who have already gotten phase one, is one of the groups you're competing with. So you really have to have your act together. Uh, I've had groups that had very good teams, good technology. They went after NIH direct to phase two, and basically they were the NIH came back and said, you know, you guys haven't had any funding from us. You're a new company. We're not going to give you a direct phase two. Please apply for a phase one. So it's just something to think about there. Uh, I have had gr groups though apply for direct to phase two and get them but they were existing companies, they had a track record, um, and they may not have done, you know, gone quite as far in that technology, but they, they had their act together. So it's just consider those if you're going direct to phase two. So I'm gonna move on and talk a little bit about three phase SC and, and what we do. So three phase SC, <clears throat> is an initiative by the South Carolina Department of Commerce that they put together to increase the competitiveness of proposals for SBR, STTR across the state. Um, you know, I, Tyler Tatum, and and uh, my partner in crime, Ron Garman, we work to implement the three-phase program. Um, and, you know, our goal is is to do what you know what we can to improve uh SBR STTR funding across the state um to get into a little bit of details there and by the way I feel like South Carolina is very lucky to have this program because you know I've looked around at other states and and not a lot of states have this extensive of proposal support um one of the main things we do is one-on-one -on -one proposal support. So our goal with proposal support is to take you through everything from like, how do I get my company registered with all the things I have to worry about? Uh, do you know, how do I start filling out all these, these different components of the application? Um, you know, can someone look over my proposal and give me some feedback? 
um, I need to get certain support letters or maybe I need to go find even an academic partner. Um, we really dive in deep in terms of proposal support and look at how we can help each team on all these different aspects. Um, so, and a lot of times it can be everything from story building. So we do a lot of like, tell us your technology, tell us your business story, and then we will, you know, do a lot to kind of help you think through what is your value proposition? Uh, you know, are you really targeting the right things? Uh, do you have the right message? So, <clears throat> um, I also say like with getting the proposals done, getting them online, knowing what forms to fill out, you know, my goal is that we reduce your workload there by, you know, probably 75% because these things are confusing, the wording's not clear, and there's a lot of things that I can find the answers to or help you do in at least, you know, a, a, a quarter of the time that it would take you if you're not familiar. So. Um, you know, again, we're here to help. Um, how do I get started? Um, so, well, one thing with three phase is that we do have an application process, although we're always happy for you to contact us directly. You know, if you have questions ahead of time and you're like, I just want to see if I'm a good fit, let's have a conversation. Um, contact me and we'll set up a phone call. Um, but we do have like an official application process on the threephasesc.com website. You can go on there and, and apply for the program. Uh, it's not really a yes, no, we're gonna call you, we're gonna talk through your application. It'll be a conversation. You know, we want we want to help, so. So how do I get started with SBRS TTR? Number one thing uh, is dealing with this today before this call, electronic registrations. Get them done. Uh, in particular, the one that trips a lot of people up is the third one on this list, SAM.gov. So that registration uh, is requires several people behind the scenes approving your registration, and it's not a quick process. Um, everything else pretty much on this list can happen within a day or less. SAM.gov can take up to two to three weeks. Um, the people that are approving your application, you cannot get them on the phone, um, even if you beg and plead. So get that done early. That's all I'm saying about that and understand your registration. So usually I push people. And if you have a SAM registration, make sure it's up to date. I have a group right now I'm working on that's got to get a proposal in this week. and. Two weeks ago, we realized the SAM registration was expired. And, you know, again, we're pushing to get that done. But um, that's the main thing I'll say on registrations. I have a cheat sheet on this. I can send it to you if you want to get started. Um, Ten key questions. A lot of these we've talked over. I'm just going to hit the high points and then open it up for more questions. Um, Good support letters, so some agencies don't even allow support letters, but most of them require them, or they don't require them, but they're, they're, they really increase your chances of getting funding. So if we're working with you, we'll definitely talk through that, but think about support letters from people who are saying, this is a good idea, I'd really like to see them, you know, show me X, Y, Z, and I'd be excited about being a customer, partner, investor, et cetera. Uh, those are great and very important for most of the proposals. Um, letters of permission. So, you know, if you're pulling IP out of the university, you need a letter from the university. If you're renting lab space that you don't rent right now, you need a letter. You need a letter from consultants, subcontractors. You know, we have lists for this, but that's one of the things that trips people up and can take a lot of time. Um, I just want to pick. Uh, there's a lot of documents, and again, if we're working with you, we'll lead you through it. But you got to read the RF RFP and make sure you're covering all these little, you know, requirements. Uh, some agencies don't have as many. Groups like National Institute of Health have a lot.
especially if you're doing human subjects. So just make sure you you understand all the documents you have to submit. Um, <clears throat> but that's pretty much it. I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions again. Um, again, we're here to help. Um, before or you know after this webinar, you can also follow up with questions via email. All right. Thank you so much. We do have the questions that have come in, but please keep them coming. Um, the first question is from Jonathan saying, do early application submissions have a higher success rate over those submitted closer to the deadline? Tyler? No. No, it, it really, most of them, they don't actually transmit the application to the program manager until the app, the whole process closes. Um, <clears throat> you know, so there's no advantage to getting it in early. Um, I will say though, that getting it in early is not a bad thing, especially giving yourself as much in, in terms of, you know, days before the submission, because, you know, two things can happen. One, you may think of things that you need to fix on the application and you have time to go back and fix them. There are also errors that come up as you go deeper into submitting. Uh, the worst is National Institute of Health. Um, you go through, like, until you get all the documents up there, you don't know what you're missing. So you go to validate the application and it, you can end up with errors that you didn't realize you had. And if you're within, I mean, I've gotten proposals done within two hours of the deadline, start to finish, but, you know, getting it submitted on the line. But, I mean, that was like a miracle. Um, really, these, you got to have time to deal with all these things. So the earlier, the better in terms of your chances, because you're going to catch more things and you're not going to be rushed. So that's an important part of getting it done early. But the actual selection process, um, everything gets filed like basically after the deadline gets sent off to the program managers. Great, thank you. All right, another one has come in from Lynn. The question is, are there any programs that have a preference for traumatic brain injury work in the clinical trial industry? That's probably going to be the two that would come to mind there are National Institute of Health uh, and or National Science Foundation. Um, it's more than likely going to be National Institute of Health, and we can kind of dig into that a little bit more. Um, one thing I'll mention about National Institute of Health that's nice is that the review process is very completely independent of the program managers there. So you can actually, the program managers tend to be very accessible and you can even send them your your summary or names page and, and they will review it and give you feedback. You can ask them like, what are you funding these days? What's not getting funded? Um, because they're not part of the review process. So they're independent and you can treat them like an in-house coach. So that's a good one where it's like, okay, let's figure out where you might target with NIH, and then we can go, um, and I'll get on the phone calls if I'm working with a team a lot of times, but you can go have a conversation with the program manager and say, do I fit your sub-agency, or is there another group within NIH that's a better fit? Um, National Science Foundation, the reason I mentioned them is because they're they're looking for Again, game-changing leaps. So depending on where your technology fits in that concept, they may or may not be a good target. Um, sometimes they'll fund medical-related technologies that are maybe like, um, you know, something around like the ability to, you know, the, the pregnancy test model before there was a pregnancy test, right? That was kind of like highly controversial and something that was very new. Uh, in terms of, gosh, I can do a test at home and get an accurate result, you know, or there could be things with, uh, you know, various assays or testing um, that are extremely novel, and there's a, like, a big leap in technology that you're pushing um, that maybe NIH isn't quite ready to fund because it's a little too risky for them. So 
it just depends on your technology, but we can talk offline. Really good information there. So the, it looks like this might be the last question for right now, but here it is. You spoke about the PI needing to be funded by 51% of the existing company. My specific research and technology checks off all the qualifying boxes except for this one. I have heard of this being an issue with others and academics. What is your recommendation to either finding a PI or partner that may qualify as an entrepreneurial lead? Tyler? Yeah, it's a good question. And and again, I'd, you know, happy to talk offline in more detail. Um, sometimes, especially if you're like a faculty, you may have a PhD or postdoc that can fit that model. Um, uh, you may be able to go out and, you know, search for other partners. Um, there's a lot of creative solutions there that you have to, you know, this is where it's good to have a conversation because there are rules and there are creative ways to work the rules. Um, I even worked with a company that had a NASA proposal and they basically borrowed the PI from the subcontractor. Um, 51, they, they borrowed like 55% of the PI's time from the subcontractor. So the person stayed employed with the subcontractor, which was a large business, um, and was 45% employed by them, 55% employed by the small business. And NASA really was like, fine, just get the work done. Um, National Science Foundation, on the other hand, would probably, you know, be a bit, that would be a big no-no. Um, so there are creative solutions there, I'd say. Um, but, you know, it's just something we need to talk through. One other issue on that that we've done with several groups, too, is you can do, and I used to not recommend this, but with NIH, you know, they're so picky about National Institute of Health, they're so picky about resumes and, like, being credentialed in that technology. Um, I've had several groups that are doing uh, multi-PI proposals where, say, you have a postdoc or a business person that's the lead in the company and is 51% employed by the company. And then you have a co-PI, and they don't call it a co-PI, it's just multi-PI, but that doesn't have to meet any of the requirements that is in the, say, university or otherwise. And so that allows you to kind of work around that rule, especially for National Institute of Health, is to do a multi-PI proposal. And, and you can actually do an SBIR you know, in that case, and the second PI, only one PI has to meet the requirements. All right, well, Tyler, we are just on time here, ending all of the questions, ending the presentation two minutes before our scheduled stop time, so that's wonderful. Um, everyone Good. can view the, um, the screen right now and see Tyler's direct contact information. Um, please contact him or contact me if you have any questions about this and we'll be happy to answer them for you all. Um, this webinar will be posted on our website, on our SCRA website. And um, so access to this presentation will be posted there. Um, please check out our website to see what future webinars and uh, launch and learns we have coming up. But now I would just like to say thank you so much to Tyler for helping to spread the word um, about SPIRs and STTRs here um, to all of our um, attendees on the line. Thank you so much for your time. And um, I hope everyone has a safe and happy rest of their week. So thank you. Sounds great, thank you. And uh, you know, just one quick wrap up, you know, the three phase SC website is a great resource. and. There's a contact us on there that does, I will get the, you know, those emails directly as well. So um, please follow up with questions. All right, thank you all and bye-bye.